thanks, Amy. And, uh, you know, everything that we have, uh, we lay at the foot of the cross, don't we? That's true. And, um, you know, I was thinking, I'll pray for the offering, and then you pray for the ministry of God's Word, all right? Great. All right, let's all pray together. Father, thank you for the privilege of coming before you in the strong name of Jesus, the strong tower that we run into and are saved. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Lord, that uh, giving is an act of worship, and all that we are and have, we give to you. Thank you for these gifts here given by faith, coming out of homes and families and uh, jobs uh, where there are needs. And these are gifts that are given by faith, faith that there is a God who will take them and use them faith that there is a God who will see their own needs and meet them. Thank you, Lord, that we are never disappointed when we trust you. Thank you, Lord, that we are never disappointed when we give to you and, and partner with you. So be with those who will steward these gifts so that they're used to bear fruit for your kingdom and for your glory and bless the giver. Be with the one, Lord, tonight who cannot give and meet their needs and strengthen them and help us as a church as we support them. Thank you for the privilege of offering these gifts to you now as an act of worship. Lord, as uh, we physically are kneeled here before you tonight, that is the position that you would want our hearts to be at this point, that they would be submitted to you and kneeling before you and worshiping you. And now, Lord, as we listen to your word and as James comes and, and shares what you have laid on, your, on his heart, God, I pray that we'd be leaning into it and eager to receive it. Yes, and Lord that your Holy Spirit would be very, very present here, Lord, that he would not only empower James as he speaks and gives him clarity of thought and the words that would communicate accurately the truth of your word and its application to our life, but that, Lord, your Holy Spirit would be moving in the midst of here and in our individual lives and that our, our hearts would be ready to receive what it yes. is you want to say to us tonight, Lord, yes, Lord, and apply it so that we'd be more like your son, Jesus Christ. God, we love you. You are so faithful. And Lord, we just pray now, uh, as James preaches, that you would use him. Empower him, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, we're glad that you're here tonight, and uh, we love you in the Lord, and we're thankful for the chance to minister to you. Why don't you take your Bibles, if you have one with you, and uh, get over to uh, Hebrews chapter 9, all right? And... Uh, I was thinking this week about the story you may have heard of the uh, man who was uh, trying to move a stove. And if you've ever tried to kind of lug a big piece of uh, furniture and appliance around, you know that's a big job. And uh, he had it right in the middle of his front door and a man walking down the street uh, saw the predicament that he was in. And being a good neighbor, he kind of ran and introduced himself and says, let me help you, let me help you. And so they went at the job of moving the stove together and they were grunting and pushing and ultimately sweating and and finally exasperated, and the homeowner said, you know, I just, I just can't, we, we are never going to get this stove out of the house. And the guy who tried to help him said, out? You're trying to get it out? And uh, all of a sudden, of course, they realized that they have been working against each other. And uh, that's the uh, story that came to mind when I thought about um, uh, this series on Hebrews. And... Uh, you know, we are attempting something that is really pretty challenging. I can just tell you, I'm finding it challenging uh, to go through the book of Hebrews verse by verse by verse. And the theme of our uh, series this year is Don't Stop Now. And uh, the theme of chapter 7 through 10 is Fire Up. And uh, we've been going through, probably without question, the deepest uh, passage in all of God's Word, uh, Christologically and soteriologically speaking. Christology is the study of the person of Christ. And who is Jesus exactly? And then soteriology is the study of salvation and the doctrine of salvation and, and what really was accomplished for us on the cross of Calvary. And uh, so we're going to be doing this now and we need to work together, all right? And we're going to be doing this for, uh, I think, two or three more weeks and then we're going to start a new series uh, on faith, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, and then all of a sudden Hebrews is going to get so practical uh, and, and applicable uh, to many, many situations in our life, you can't believe it. But I'm glad we have a couple more weeks in this, and I'm finding, I can tell you in my own heart, that focusing upon Jesus Christ, who He is, and what He's done, has been uh, a, a great uh, nourishing for me and my own passion and love for the Lord. I find my heart is very, very tender to the Lord right now, and uh, I hope that you're sensing that same thing in your own experience. 
And it's so important that we commit and kind of work together and give God's Word our greatest and most focused uh, attention. All right? So about three more messages on this leading up to Easter and then Easter Sunday, God willing, uh, we're going to start into Hebrews chapter 11 and a verse-by-verse study there on an amazing message about faith. So uh, tonight I'm up earlier if you like to kind of uh, measure out the time in the service and that's not because I'm going to preach for the remainder of the time. I'm actually going to be a little bit shorter in our our study time tonight and we're going to have a longer, uh, less hurried a time uh, remembering the Lord around the Lord's table. And so I feel like I just want to tell you right now, just to begin to prepare your heart uh, to remember the Lord. And uh, if you're a follower of Jesus, within about 30 minutes, uh, you're going to be taking into your hands the bread and the cup, uh, symbols of Christ's broken body and his shed blood. And the Bible has a lot to say about how we're not to do that casually or indifferently. And we're not to do it without bringing to mind the very sin for which Christ died. And so you could begin even now the process of self-examination with which this message will conclude. But I'm in, as I said, Hebrews chapter 9, and uh, you'll recognize this. Uh, I want to go over tonight the argument in the text, kind of the line of thinking or the argument of the author, his rationale. Uh, The argument, and then the issues, a couple of issues that are raised, and then the application, all right? That's where we're going to go in the next few minutes. And let's start with the main argument or the thrust of the passage. It's this. Uh, Jesus' last will and testament is better, it's final, and it's available. And Jesus' last will and testament is better, final, and available. That's going to take us through the end of chapter 9. Now, if it seems like you've heard those things before, uh, the reason you feel like you have is because you have. All right, that was in chapter 7, that was in chapter 8, and now it, here it is in chapter 9 again. Jesus is better. I feel like I'm saying for like a month now, uh, good evening, good morning, welcome to harvest. Uh, Jesus is better. And then the next week you're back again and I'm, I'm uh, hello again. Uh, Jesus is still better and, and way better. And, and so I want to remind you that Hebrews is a sermon, all right? It's not a letter like in the epistles. Hebrews actually is a sermon. And, and because it's a sermon that was inspired by the Spirit of God, it takes uh, about 30 to 40 minutes to read it. If you sit down and read the book of Hebrews, I hope you've done that. It would take you about 30 or 40 minutes. It might take about 50 or 60 minutes to preach the whole message of Hebrews. Uh, but we're spending a whole year on it because God didn't preach many sermons that we have in writing. And so we're breaking it down, taking it apart verse by verse, word by word, And tonight we're starting in in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, where it says this. Therefore, he is, speaking of Jesus, he is the mediator of a new covenant. And I would just remind you that that word covenant means a will. We've learned that here a few weeks back. And uh, you'll remember that a will is drawn up to assure that following uh, the death of the person's will, that the right people get the right stuff. Isn't that why you have a will? How many people have a will? If you have a will, it's because you want to make sure the right people get the right stuff. Am I right? And mainly you want to make sure the government doesn't get much at all. Okay? And uh, that's why you have a will. Well, uh, this word translated covenant here is the last will or the last testament of Jesus Christ. And he is the mediator of a new will or covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. I love that idea of the decision to follow Jesus being a response to a call. Have you heard the call? Have you heard the call of Jesus Christ? Have you heard the call that he places upon every person, upon every human heart to turn to him and respond to the gospel? Have you heard that call? It's like I was going along in my life in this direction and I heard, hey! And I was like, whoa, there is a God and he's real. And I turned around and I came to him. Do you have a story like that? I haven't shared my conversion story for a long, long time. I I came to know Christ uh, when I was just a boy. Um, It was uh, February of 1967. And I went to church with my parents on a Sunday night. And I remember that the pastor was preaching on the Apostle Paul. That's all I can remember. But I know that at the end of the message, he gave the gospel. And he told us that our sins could be forgiven. And even as a little boy, I knew that I wasn't ready to go to heaven. And I was afraid to die. And I didn't know what would happen to me. And I knew that I was a sinner and I'd done wrong things. I can remember when he invited people to come forward to receive Christ. I remember that my heart was pounding out of my chest. And I wanted to go down there so bad. But I I was afraid and I didn't go. 
And then I felt bad because we were walking out of church, and I, I said to my parents, I said, I said to my dad, Dad, I want to go down to the front. It was hard for me to say that, but I said, Dad, Dad, I want to go down to the front. Well, you'd have to know what kind of kid I was, and my dad thought I wanted to go run around the church. And he wanted to get home. It was a winter night, you know, and, and he said, no, I'm not going down to the front of the church, just get in the car. So I, I was trying to process that, and, and I, all the way home, I was like, whoa, I'm so upset, you know, and, and my dad doesn't want me to go down front, you know, and I thought they were bringing me here because they sort of wanted me to, you know, and, and so I got home, I can remember, and I was all dressed up for church, and I took off my clothes and threw them in the bottom of my closet in my bedroom and stomped out to the kitchen, seven years old, and said to my mom and dad, they were, I can see them to this moment, standing there drying the dishes, and, and, and I was like, I want to know why you guys don't want me to get saved. <laughs> and, and, and of course, then out comes the story, and they're just like, oh, oh, we didn't understand. And my mother took her Bible. I can still see it. She had a red Bible. And she took me into her room, and she opened the Bible, and she explained to me how I could give my life to Jesus. And I knelt down beside her bed there and prayed and gave my heart to the Lord. I heard the call. Now, your story could be so much different than that. But do you have a story? See, notice it says that Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. In other words, we're still hearing that call. You're still hearing it, aren't you? T uh, take up your cross and follow me, Jesus says. And uh, so there's some stuff that he wants to get to us. There's some promises that he wants to keep. I'm so glad that Jesus is the one who mediates his own will. I'm so glad that, that he's the one that makes sure uh, that, that we get the things uh, that his death uh, was to provide. Notice in verse 16, for where uh, a will is, see now he's using the actual word, for where a will is involved, the death of one who made it must be established. Obviously, there's no executing of the will until someone has died. In fact, that's what verse 17 says. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. I track with that. It's pretty self-evident, right? Okay, I think that's just really very clear. Verse 18, therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. I'm going to say more about that uh, in a moment, but the point that he's making there is that this is nothing new. In the old covenant, in the old uh, system, there was many rules, no capacity to obey, harsh consequences for failure, a law, not love. That was the old covenant. In the new covenant, the responsibility shifts to God. And the heart is different. It's a heart of love. And the provision is changed. It's 100% God. The payment required by a holy God was, verse 18, Therefore not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. Verse 19, For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats. We talked about that last week. The blood of calves and goats. Uh, Exodus 12. Uh, is the Passover uh, description. Leviticus 14 uh, talks about the ceremony of the red heifer that's hinted at here. Numbers 19, I think also is hinted at here. The blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the... Well, i got to talk about that part for a second. You're like, what? what's all that stuff? Well, we talked about the blood of calves and of goats. The water uh, was used by the priest for washing. And obviously they got uh, pretty... Uh, spattered in the process of the slaughtering of these animals and so the water was for cleansing and there was ritual cleansing you say well what's this scarlet wool scarlet wool actually there was a strip of of wool that was dyed scarlet that was uh, placed around the neck of the scapegoat that we talked about last week remember one goat uh, slaughtered for the sins of the people one goat the hands placed upon and the goat sent out into the wilderness as a picture of putting away sin how many people were here last week when I talked about that all right, well, a little bit more on that uh, just now. A lady came up to me last Sunday, and uh, just a wonderful lady, and she was so enthusiastic about studying God's Word. And, and she said to me, oh, Pastor James, she said, I was hoping you were going to talk about that part that I heard a pastor talk about recently, uh, that the Jewish people um, understood that on the Day of Atonement, they would take that little strip of, of uh, wool that had been dyed scarlet, and uh, after uh, the sacrifices had been made, uh, the uh, miraculously, uh, the wool would turn white. And how many people have heard about this? Has anybody? Some of you have? The wool would turn white. And then she said, have you heard that 
uh, about 40 years before the destruction of the temple, about 30 AD, the very time that Jesus died, uh, the wool stopped turning white. And uh, just seemed to be that God was no longer accepting those sacrifices anymore. And I had heard that, but I did a little bit more study on it this week. And I want to use it as an opportunity to try to teach you about something that I think we need to be very, very careful about as Christians. Um, that uh, concept actually comes from the Talmud. Do you know what the Talmud is? Uh, it's really the uh, Jewish writings, the writings of Judaism, which records their history and many of their teachings and many of their interpretations of the Old Testament. And uh, the reality is, is that that idea that um, the, the scarlet uh, piece of wool stopped turning white right about the time Jesus was crucified, um, it is true. There were actually four or five miraculous things that they report in the Talmud would happen on the Day of Atonement. Uh, some of those things are uh, that um, the lamp uh, that lit the area for worship would, would burn continuously. The fire on the altar would burn without having its fuel renewed. Um, there was uh, the priest would take just a little olive-sized piece of bread and, and eat it, and they would be full, and, they can, and then this wool turning white. They considered these the confirmations on the Day of Atonement. And actually, they didn't really stop in 30 AD. They stopped over a period of several hundred years that culminated in the last 40 years of serious decline before the destruction of the temple. Now, here's the reason why I have a problem with that, and I want you to watch out for this when you hear teaching like this, all right? This whole idea, I don't know if it's accurate or not. I really don't know. I think it's interesting. But where did it come from? Did it come from God's Word? No, it came from the Talmud, all right? Do you know what the Talmud says? The Talmud says that Jesus was neither virtuous nor was he the Messiah, and it absolutely radically rejects everything that we hold dear do you see why we wouldn't go and get confirmations of our faith from a document that is actually written to tear down our faith? Do you understand that? All right? And Christians need to be wise about these matters. Listen, everything we need for faith and practice is found in the Word of God. And when you're listening to someone teach God's Word and they're like, well, geography says, or, or ancient literature says, or Josephus says, or these are all points that are they're, they're, they're somewhat interesting, but they're not God's Word, all right? And faith comes by hearing the Word of God. That's what God's blessing, that's what God's backing. Let me say even of myself. When I'm teaching, and you know I'll come to a point and say, you know, I think there's five things that I think of when I think of this. I think it's interesting. I think hopefully that there can be some helpfulness to that. But if it's not coming directly out of the scriptures, give it the authority it deserves. Oh, this is a thought Pastor James had. It's interesting to me. But what we really want to know is, and what we really want to feed our souls on, and what we really want to build our faith on is what God's word says. Amen? Amen. All right. All right. Verse 19 then. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop. All right, well, hyssop was like a, do we have a picture of that? Hyssop was like a, a long a branch, you can see it there, with blue flowers that would blossom in the summer. And they used this uh, like a paintbrush. In fact, you'll remember David said when he was dealing with his own sin in Psalm 51, David said, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. It's the idea that they would take the blood and use that a hyssop, that's all right, to sprinkle that around. And so that's why you see that here in the text. Scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both uh, the book itself and all the people. Now why that's there, I got to tell you, I don't entirely know. The Bible in the Old Testament doesn't say anything about sprinkling of uh, the book. Uh, whether that's figurative or not, I'm not sure. I know that uh, 1 Peter uh, says... Uh, that um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 says, uh, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. Well, that's clearly figurative. None of us have been literally uh, sprinkled with Christ's blood. I'm just not entirely sure uh, why it says that. This is the blood, and then, and then, but this I understand clearly, verse 20, saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded uh, for you. Uh, that's a quote from Exodus 24, and Jesus at the Last Supper, which we're going to remember here in a moment, uh, Jesus quoted Exodus 24, saying, this is the blood of the covenant, all right? The blood is the payment for the will that, uh, 
entrusts to us eternal life by faith. Verse 21, and in the same way he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That'd be a really good verse to underline in your Bible. That's one of the key verses in the entire New Testament about the saving work of Christ. That without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. I'm going to say more about that uh, in a moment. Thus it was necessary for copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Now that's really cool because what he's saying is, is they, sp they would sprinkle with blood the various instruments used in worship in the Old Testament and so on and so forth. Uh, but the things, what are the things that had to be purified in heaven? What are the heavenly things? Well, it's nothing that's used in worship there. Everything there is pure to the max. We're the heavenly things. Oh, that's so cool. We're the ones who are sprinkled with the blood of Jesus so that we're fit uh, for eternity with God in heaven. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. We've talked a lot about that. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood, not his own. For then he would have had to, Jesus, then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the south foundation of the world. But as it is, Speaking of Jesus, he appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice, what? Of himself. And just as, as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Another key verse to underline in your scriptures. That's, uh, what do you think about reincarnation? Uh, not very much. Uh, the answer is uh, not very much. You say, well, if I ever get to live this life again, that's a big if, buddy. That's a big if. It is appointed unto man once, and all God's people said, once to die, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. All right, because, everybody look up here for a minute. How many people would agree that there's a lot in that content that we've been over in the last two or three weeks would you agree so because that's true and I have a couple more minutes I want to use some time now to talk about a couple of issues that are raised by the text and try to give us a little broader doctrinal understanding for our faith all right thinking caps on I want to talk about two issues two doctrinal issues two important issues about which you ought to have a conviction two issues that are raised in the text the first one has to do with uh, blood versus death the reason why we want to study these issues is because uh, if our theology is wrong, our worship's defective. Do you get it? How can you worship a God you're mixed up about? And some people say, oh, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. How wrong you are. In fact, uh, there are some things you can believe differently about. You can believe differently about when exactly you believe Christ is coming back. You can believe differently about the role of women. You can believe differently about the holy gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay, but you can't believe differently about who Jesus is and what he did without some eternal consequences. So, um, I want to talk to you first of all about uh, the blood of Christ versus the death of Christ. And David Jones helped me a great deal with this. The word blood appears 99 times in the New Testament. Uh, many of these are positive references to the blood of Christ. Listen, for instance, Peter refers to the precious blood of Christ, 1 Peter 1.19. Paul said we have redemption through his blood... Ephesians 1, 7, and that we have been brought near by the blood of Christ, Ephesians 2, 13. The author of Hebrews says that Christ's blood purifies our conscience, Hebrews 9, 14, we just looked at that, and sanctifies us, the blood of Christ, Hebrews 13, 12. Uh, John said that it cleanses from all sin, 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. It gives us confidence to enter the holy place. We're going to look at that next week in Hebrews 10. Now, this emphasis on the blood of Christ has actually carried over into uh, worship sung uh, in Christian churches. A quick search of blood at uh, cyberhymnal.org if you want to uh, go there. Uh, 689 hits, including such classics as Are You Washed in the Blood? Nothing But the Blood? And There Is a Fountain Filled with What? With Blood. 
Now, all of this emphasis on the blood has led some critics uh, to call Christianity a bloody religion. For instance, Voltaire once said, Christianity is the most ridiculous, most absurd, and bloody religion that has ever infected the world. The scandalous nature of the blood has led many mainline churches, in our day many mainline uh, Protestant churches, have stripped all references to the blood of Christ out of their hymnals. They just don't sing about it, they don't talk about it. And uh, there was quite a public outcry, as you'll remember, against uh, the bloody nature of Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ. In fact, so much so that this year I understand they've uh, released a toned down uh, version of that. Um, what exactly are we to think of all this? Well, there's kind of two approaches, and here's the first one that's wrong. It's what you might call a mystical approach. And uh, while the blood of Christ is not to be downplayed or hidden as a scandal, some people take an overly literal, almost mystical approach to the blood of Christ. And this was common during the Middle Ages, but for example, a, uh, a fairly modern teacher, though he's with the Lord now, so he won't mind me mentioning his name, uh, is uh, J. Vernon McGee. How many people have heard of him, J. Vernon McGee? All right, well, he taught that Hebrews 9.12 teaches, quote, I believe this verse proves that Christ, listen, took his literal blood to heaven. Fundamental and charismatic preachers, like, for example, Benny Hinn, uh, believes that the literal blood of Jesus is still entirely in existence. Have you ever heard of Bob Jones University? And back in 1986, uh, Bob Jones uh, University and their... Uh, publication Faith for the Family, accused John MacArthur of heresy for saying it is not his bleeding that saved me, but his dying. In fact, the World Congress of Fundamentalists, an event I would never want to attend, passed a resolution that Christ's literal blood is eternally preserved in heaven, and they'll break fellowship with anyone who doesn't believe that Christ's literal blood is in heaven right now. So when they sing there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel, they believe there is one actually is one in heaven right now, a big pool of Christ's blood. On the other end of the spectrum, there are various pastors through the years. Uh, for example, a pastor from Bacharach Bible Church in Houston, Texas, wrote a book called The Blood of Christ, where he argues uh, that his literal blood has no spiritual significance at all. And so what exactly are we to make of this? A little trip to English class will help. Um, uh, have you ever heard of the uh, literary device called metonymy? All right. Metonymy is the idea of referring to a whole by its parts. For example, if, if you were to say, I have three mouths to feed, uh, we understand that you don't mean you have three mouths to feed. You're talking not about mouths, but about what? Talking about people, your children. If, if you say the White House called a press conference, do you mean like the building knows how to dial the phone? No, you mean what? You mean the president or one of his aides called a president? Everybody understand that? All right. In the same sense, then, it's where the, the, the part refers to the whole. And it's the same thing, for example, when Paul mentioned the power of the cross or boasted in the cross, or he said that the cross reconciled Jews and Gentiles. He wasn't talking about the physical piece of wood. He was talking about the work that was done on the cross. And in the same sense of that, just as the cross stands as a symbol for what happened on it, likewise, the blood is a symbol for Christ's bloody death. Do you understand that? We're talking about the blood of Christ. We're talking about his death. That's what we're talking about. The fact that he suffered as a payment for sin. It was Christ's death that averted God's wrath. And it was his shed blood that symbolizes the suffering God requires as payment for sin. Now back to Hebrews 9 and look at verses um, 17 and 18. He says, for a will takes effect only at death, since it's not in force as long as the one who made it's alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without, what's it say? What's it say? So he's using blood and death synonymously. Do you get it? It's the same thing. And as usual, the power is in the balance. Okay? Now Christ's literal blood is not, it's not the chemicals coursing through Jesus' vein. It's his death for sin. And yet it was a painful death. And it was a death of suffering. And so uh, the shedding of blood is emblematic of a suffering, painful, meritorious death that satisfied the holiness of God. Got it? Okay, so that you understand what we're talking about when we sing about and in a moment when we remember the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of sins. That's the first issue. Here's the second one. 
And this idea of a single sacrifice versus a continual sacrifice. I think it's pretty important. And uh, my daughter went to a, uh, a uh, funeral this week in a uh, Catholic church. And she came home, let me tell you, with a lot of questions. And uh, Dad, what was happening here? And, and what was this about exactly? And I uh, told her and I hope taught her to be respectful of what other people believe. Uh, but at the same time, I think, um, let me just say that uh, the Catholic Church uh, sees the celebration of the Mass as a perpetual offering of Christ. Now, do you understand what that means? That when they're remembering the Mass, what they believe is, is that his body and blood are being sacrificed again. In fact, their own documents uh, say, quote, the Mass is the same sacrifice as that of the cross, because the offering of the and the priest are the same. Christ our blessed Lord and the ends for which the sacrifice of the Mass is offered are the same as the sacrifice of the cross. They believe that there's an atoning work that's happening, that further uh, payment for sin is going on in that moment. Now, I, I hope that I'm gracious, and I'll say something about this in a moment, with people who disagree or do things differently. But some things really matter, okay? And that really matters. And the Orthodox Church believes that Christ is truly present in the Eucharist. From an outsider's viewpoint, the Orthodox teaching and the Catholic are nearly indistinguishable. And uh, the Orthodox Church uh, sees the Eucharist as a sacrifice, and this is affirmed in the words of the priest when he says, during the Eucharist, quote, thine own of thine own we offer unto thee on behalf of all and for all. The sacrifice offered at the Eucharist is Christ himself being offered right there. Now, that is an affront to the finished work of Christ. Uh, more specifically, it's an affront to Hebrews chapter 9, which says, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly. How clear could that be? For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly. That's a problem since the foundation of the world. As it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice himself. And just it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered, tell me, once, once, have a conviction about that. Have a conviction about that. If you find yourself of necessity in a place where the Lord is being remembered in a way that teaches that he's being offered as a sacrifice for sin, should I participate? No. No, I should not. Why? Well, because I have a conviction that Jesus is not still uh, suffering and atoning for sin. His work is finished. Now, th now, this matters, all right? This is not some small point. I hope that I'm far from petty. One of the things we say at Harvest is on the major's conviction, on the minor's tolerance, in all things love. Amen? All right? But when it matters, it matters. And when God's scripture is clear, we need to have a conviction about that. And no born-again follower of Jesus Christ should ever celebrate the Mass. Ever. Because Jesus is not being offered again for sin. You say, well, they're sincere. I believe they are. I'm not questioning that. I'm just saying, let's be biblical. God has told us uh, these things. They've been made very clear. All right. Those two issues. And the gospel. Listen, what the gospel is and what it accomplishes is, a, is, the, is the grand theme. All right. And if you're ever going to come out of your chair, if you're ever going to pound the table a little bit, if you're ever going to be fired up about something, be fired up about the gospel. Amen? Amen? And everybody who's for the gospel, we're for them. And everybody who's against the gospel, we have a problem with that. And I don't like to build fences, and I don't like to cause problems all the time. All right? But I want to stand for the gospel. Amen? Just as the scripture has, has proclaimed it. And... Uh, I want to stand ultimately with everybody who stands for the gospel. Now, Friday was a pretty amazing day. And uh, we had uh, the pastor from Willow Creek, Bill Hybels, was over here at our church and took a tour around our building. And then he and I, along with our Joe Stoll, jumped in a car and drove to the south side of Chicago and uh, met with James Meeks there, the pastor of Salem Baptist Church. And Erwin Lutzer was there and several pastors from uh, churches God is using all over Chicagoland 
And uh, here I am riding in a car with, with someone and meeting with a group of people. Listen, in, in methodology, in approach to ministry, in many different things, there would be substantive points of disagreement, all right? But always in the context of recognition that people, listen, people who believe in the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ as the only hope for a fallen humanity, anybody who believes the gospel, anybody we're going to spend eternity with is our brother and sister in Christ. And in the broader sense of the word, when we have an opportunity to work with, to partner with, to stand with, to support, to pray for the efforts of people who are working for the same Lord and the same gospel that we are, we ought to do that. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Now let's go with this gospel uh, to the Lord's table. The application. The application. And I think pretty uh, straightforward from the text. The first thing we do as we approach the Lord's table is we examine ourselves. We examine ourselves. Where there's no self-examination, there's no awareness of personal sin. True? Where there's no awareness of personal sin, there's no true gratitude for the work of Christ on the cross. How can I revel in a solution for which provided for a problem I don't have? You get it? You get it? So, if I don't have an awareness of personal sin, I don't have a gratitude for the gospel. Who, who wants a, a solution for a problem they don't have? So, examine yourself. You say, well, Pastor James, how do I do that? Well, you get a pen in your hand, like many of you have right now, and you pray, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, O God, and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. And you ask God to search you. You say, Lord, show me where I failed. Lord, show me where I failed my spouse. Lord, show me where I failed my children. Lord, show me where I failed you in my, own, in my mind and in my heart and in my actions and in my attitudes. Now, if you want to know, God will show you. If you want to just, I oh, got the check mark. Hey, Lord, is there anything? Oh, okay, nothing. All right. Uh, that's not going to go anywhere very good. But if you take some time, like we're going to do here in a moment, you can't believe the things the Lord will convict you about and bring to your mind. That was wrong when you said that. And you shouldn't have never been there. And, and well, what, do you, what did you look at that for? And, and why were you thinking this? And you need to let that go. And, and gently, gently, lovingly, firmly, if you examine yourself. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, coming to the Lord's table, Paul said that a man should examine himself. Don't take the bread and the cup in your hand if you're not doing this. If you're not examining yourself. If you do so, you take the, uh, the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. And you're actually heaping judgment upon yourself. In Corinth, Paul said some people were sick and some people were dead. Because they did not rightly discern the Lord's body. They, they casually or indifferently. They, they, they took the elements in their hand and, and they had... They had, they had bitterness and, and anger and unforgiveness in their hearts toward people right in the same room with them. It's so wrong. Don't do that. Examine yourself. And then uh, embrace forgiveness. Embrace it for yourself. Jesus died to pay for my sins and I embrace that. I receive that forgiveness that he offers. Amen? And, 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 and accept that sense of cleansing you don't get forgiveness because you know about it, and it's not yours because you know someone who has it, and it's not yours even because you believe it's true from a distance. It's yours because the transformation begins when you embrace it for yourself. You've done that, haven't you? I believe you have, and it's so important not only to examine ourselves, but to uh, embrace forgiveness. Yes, I am a sinner needing God's forgiveness. Yes, Jesus paid the price for my forgiveness by his blood, by his atoning, suffering death, he satisfied the demands of a holy God. All right, let's bow together, and we're going to take some time now, and I would really appreciate it if no one would leave, if you can possibly stay just for these next 25 minutes or so. Let's don't have anyone getting up and going, let's don't have anyone distracting anyone else. And even before the servers come, let's just begin to do that. Let's begin to examine ourselves. What awesome revelation can come to us in this moment if we open our hearts to receive. What grace can be ours 
Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Those who hold on to disappointment, resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness, lusts of the flesh and of the eyes and of the heart, the pride of life. These things are of the world and not of Christ. These are the things that scar and sour our experience. These are the things that mute the message of God's glory through our lives. And he stands so ready to cleanse and to receive. But let a man examine himself. Let a woman examine herself. I'm going to ask those who are here to serve us just to go to quietly to the place where they're going to do that now.